Earlier this year, the Ontario Human Rights Commission released the findings of its Right to Read report. And it said, in a nutshell, that the reading curriculum of this province was failing elementary students. That's already prompted an overhaul from the Ministry of Education. With us to understand what they found and what's needed to turn things around in Vaughan, Ontario, Patricia Daguerre, Chief Commissioner of the Ontario Human Rights Commission, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Jimmy Metzala, Professor and the Gail and Stephen Jaroslawski Chair in Learning Disabilities at Mount St. Vincent University, Nova Scotia, who worked with the Ontario Human Rights Commission on their investigation. And in Grand Bend, Ontario, Katie Hewitt, Special Education Teacher for Kindergarten to Grade 8 students. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And just before we start, in the interest of full disclosure, let me remind people that TVO is a provider of the province's distance and online learning through the ILC. The Independent Learning Centre has been a distance learning partner with the Ministry of Education for almost 100 years. Patricia, I wanted to start with you. Um, why did the Ontario Human Rights Commission launch a public inquiry into Ontario's language curriculum? Thank you for that question. It's a very great place to start. Uh, most of Ontario students, as you know, are enrolled in public school education, in the public school education system. And education is one of the commission's strategic priorities. And so for the last 20 years, we have worked on accessible education. A critical point was in 2012, when the Supreme Court of Canada handed down the landmark decision called Moore versus British Columbia. And the unanimous court held that education, including learning to read, is a human right. And so the, as you know, the Ontario Human Rights uh, Commission intervened in that case. And it continued to work in this area. And for example, in 2018, the commission released an updated policy on accessible education for students with disabilities with recommendations for improving education outcome uh, for students with disabilities. But we continue to hear louder concerns from students and parents in the Ontario public education system, particularly regarding the largest special education exceptionality, and that is learning disability and especially uh, reading disability. And so we have the, the power under the code to conduct an inquiry. And so in October 3, 2019, we launched this inquiry. The, the evidence-based inquiry was to see the extent to which the right to read was being fulfilled in Ontario. And it's some of the concerns, if, you, if you'd like me to go into them, was that more than a quarter of grade three students and more than a half of grade three students with special education needs were not meeting the provincial standard in reading. And the, the data evinced those students from other disadvantaged groups, including students from the indigenous black and other racialized communities, students from lower socioeconomic communities, and students who are multilingual are also more likely to fall behind. And Patricia, so some of the, oh, I'm so sorry, uh, some of the points that you've brought up, um, we're going to get into as we continue with the conversation. Uh, but Katie, you took a really unique uh, approach in uh, spreading the aware awareness mm -hmm. around this inquiry. Um, you mm -hmm. took to social media. How come? Uh, you know what? It was actually. Uh, a fluke. I went home after you know a day at school where um, I had kind of seen what Patricia is talking about, and I just I spoke from the heart. Uh, back in October 2019, a colleague of mine had sent me the survey, and as I was doing the questions, it dawned on me that you know I think I think my concerns that I've had, I think people other people might feel that way too. Uh, teaching is a very isolated job and it can be a very insecure job and we're always reflecting on how we're presenting material and how we're teaching and we want to make sure that we're giving kids material that will work for them. Um, working with students is my passion and it really weighs on me that I play a role in teaching them the development of functional foundational literacy skills, right? And I want them all to leave me or leave the school in grade eight with these functional um, skills so that they can have a fulfilling future. And I want to do right by my students. So 
the right to read was not a conversation that we were necessarily having. And as I was scrolling on Twitter, because I love social media, <laughs> I saw the results uh, a couple months after they were actually released. And I, I was really frustrated that, you know, we weren't having the dialogue online or that we weren't having the dialogue in the staff room. And how come I'm hearing about this on Twitter? So I just, I spoke from my heart. I was passionate about it on Twitter or on TikTok, sorry. And the response was wild. Obviously other people, parents, students, teachers, um, graduates were sharing these same concerns. So I really appreciated that that public inquiry happened and that we were able to hear from teachers and hear from the people, the students that it was really affecting. And Jamie, uh, we've heard from Patricia about some of the gaps and Katie's mm -hmm. need to get this information out to people because I think we can all agree <laughs> that the reason we're all sitting here is because we had access to an education. Um, and right now, Ontario's curriculum employs a whole language philosophy. What does that mean, Jamie? I think there are a couple aspects of the whole language philosophy uh, to take into account when we think about the curriculum. And the first one is the idea that reading develops naturally. Um, much like when children learn to speak. So the notion is that if we immerse children in listening to books as well as reading books, they will learn to read. I think another important aspect is the idea that even skilled readers um, out of the whole language kind of philosophy, the belief is that skilled readers really what drives our reading is our oral language competence and our knowledge. And we really just have to sample the print on the page. Uh, the words aren't as primary drivers. And so what that does is it, it led to a curriculum that really focuses on teaching children um, within what we call a three cueing system approach to reading. What is that? Um, and that means that um, we start children out in kind of very easy books that are very predictable. And we teach them how to use context to predict what words they're seeing in the printed books. And so we might, um, we teach them to use their knowledge of the story, to look at the pictures, to predict what words are coming next. We also teach them uh, to use their knowledge of sentence structures would it be more likely that it's a verb or a noun? And another cue that is taught are the printed letters. But in this approach, we teach them maybe to uh, look at and know the sounds of the first letter and then predict the word. So that's kind of the approach um, of the Ontario curriculum and many curriculums across Canada at the current time. And uh, 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 Jamie, uh, Katie, Jamie just walked us through what um, the uh, whole language philosophy is and the three queuing mm -hmm. system. Uh, in your experience, is the whole language approach effective for some students? It is. It's effective for some students. Um, I think with the language curriculum, the way that it is, yes, it is effective for many kids, except <clears throat> there are strategies that are evidence-based teaching strategies that work for all kids. And so, you know, let's use those tools versus these tools. And, you know, in education, the pendulum swings a lot and things come around and, and go away a lot. And I don't think that, you know, there's not a place for whole language, but I really think that we've moved away from those phonics and the phonemic awareness and the word reading and decoding that um, make reading accessible and equitable to all. And do you think that students are moved along in the system too early? And yes, uh, you know, when we talk about um, special education and we often talk about individualized education programs and those are for students that would have a learning disability or on their way to being identified as having a learning disability or many other identifications. And what we as teachers do for those students is we put in place accommodations. Um, but accommodations are really just teaching strategies that are, are good for all students. They're just good teaching practices. Um, they're, they're supposed to act as bridges while we fill in the different gaps. But I think what's happened, and again, I'm not speaking, I, I'm not representing the union, I'm not representing my board, I'm just speaking from my own experience. What sometimes happens is that we forget to go back and teach the gaps. 
I think it's really important to hear from your experience because you're going through it. Um, Patricia, mm -hmm. I wanted to, to bring back the report, uh, Right to Read. What did the co-authors uh, hear from the teachers, parents, and students uh, that they were, that were being interviewed about the consequences of the poor language curriculum? Just by way of brief background, in our inquiry, uh, which included uh, hearing from numerous experts, community organizations, mm -hmm. more than 1,400 parents and students, and nearly 1,800 educators, um, separate surveys online, in fact, there were two, the, 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 the prevalence of the assumption is that, um, is that children are expected to learn to read, um, you know, as uh, um, the other speaker was mentioning in a particular way. But when students have difficulty learning to read, their confidence can be shaken. They have low academic uh, abilities and a low self-esteem and lead to significant mental health concerns. So many students describe that they, they themselves felt stupid because they couldn't read or even though reading disabilities have nothing to do with, uh, with intelligence. Many students and their parents told the inquiry about depression, anxiety, um, school avoidance, acting out, being bullied or being victimized, self-harming. They, they, the list of challenges if they do not teach the children properly are, you know, are legion. Students who do not develop early reading skills struggle with reading comprehension, as we know, and are more likely to struggle with, with, uh, with subjects at school. And they found that they are more likely to drop out, less likely to go to post-secondary um, education. And, and the effect continues past their schooling and can have negative impacts on, on them. For example, they may not be able to fulfill their potential in, in um, the kind of employment uh, he or she wants. And then you have this continuation, what I call intra and intra and, and uh, intergenerational impact. And so those mm -hmm. challenges as studies show, they are associated with um, how people fit into, into society. And uh, that is a big concern. Um, there, these are also um, impacting on people's social economic situations. And for example, within families themselves, um, they, there are economic losses and not to exclude the impact on society because when those children lack the ability to contribute to society, the whole of society feels it. I'm so glad you detailed that so well, Patricia, because Jamie, I think um, for maybe a lot of us, we, if we don't really consider all the impacts, like the ripple effect of someone not being able to read and maybe not feeling that they can't ask for help and being different from other people. Um, you know, the report emphasizes teaching phonics as a requirement in order to support students to develop word reading skills. So what characterizes a phonics approach? Yeah, so I think the report really um, focuses on building those foundational word reading skills. Because what we do know about skilled reading is different than the beliefs that are currently enshrined in the curriculum. We know that skilled readers actually read words quickly and automatically without um, barely any attention taken up. And that leaves, you know, all those cognitive resources to comprehend and understand text, which is really important. So phonics is one component of um, a whole reading and writing curriculum. And what it does is it teaches um, in an explicit way so that children aren't left to discover the code of our written language. Um, and it also teaches in a systematic way so that we're starting at the easiest um, skills and concepts to learn and moving to the most difficult. And why that's important is because um, in that manner, we we work with all children and move move in a way that can scaffold all children to develop the skills from most uh, readily learned to more complex. So, for example, um, we need to teach children the um, their letters and the sounds that those letters represent, as well as then to um, be able to blend those individual sounds in words in order to decode them and read them 
and to hear the individual sounds and words, a, a part of what we call phonemic awareness, which is really critical for spelling and writing words. And so we, we start teaching those letter sound correspondences and we get kids reading right away because practicing uh, reading with the, their knowledge and spelling and writing with their knowledge is really important. So we teach a handful of letter sound correspondences. Kids start to decoding. We're adding to those quite quickly, the numbers that they're learning. Um, and then they're practicing both with isolated words. And it's really important that practice also takes place in connected text, so in books mm. um, and in that way, we're enabling children to read the words on the page in books, um, and we're building that automatic quick word recognition, you know, right from novice beginners all the way to expertise. And so that's a phonics and phonemic awareness and that focus on practicing word reading skills is one critical and important component of a full literacy program. Mm -hmm. um, and Katie, you know, maybe for some parents, if it's working the way it is, they might not feel like we need to change things, but do you think it would okay. be better to serve uh, students' needs if a phonics approach was implemented across classrooms? Very much so, yes. Um, consistency is key too, right? So making sure that um, we're using the same language and the same strategies <clears throat> and using the same screening tools as we go, not just class to class or school to school, but also board to board across Ontario. Um, Basically, that's it. I just feel that, um, you know, within my early literacy groups, I have small groups that I work with, these interventions uh, uh, that Jamie was talking about, I see them working in real time, and it's amazing. And so I'm hoping that this report maybe allows for those interventions to be provided to all students in all classrooms across Ontario. It must be uh, a thrill to watch a student comprehend and get it. It is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah it's the it's seeing the confidence mm -hmm. that I find. Patricia, you, know, you wanted to say most something? rewarding. I say, as someone who is actually taught to to read by phonics and coding, one of the significance is the complexity of the English language. We have 26 letters of the alphabet, but almost 50 different sounds. And the English, um, the English language keeps importing uh, words from other um, languages, but they maintain the sounds. And so it's very important to me, as someone, as I said, who learned that way, to create that and sustain that consistency by using phonics and um, coding. Mm -hmm. Oh, I totally agree because mm -hmm. I English is my fourth language, and I learned English merely, uh, primarily by reading. And every day in studio, it's like that's not said properly because the way that I learned <laughs> is very different. Um, but Jamie, uh, Ontario is home to students who don't speak English as a first language. How is teaching phonics a part of a culturally responsive approach? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm going to borrow, I was speaking um, last week with a principal and a school team who are really starting to implement this approach and, and seeing really uh, good results. And how he explains it is that one of the most important concepts of culturally responsive pedagogy is the um, that we teach in a way that all students can be successful, that we have mm -hmm. high expectations for all students. And so from research, we know if we teach in this explicit and systematic way, giving the attention that's due to the code of our language, we can help so many students be successful, including students who have different cultural backgrounds or whose home language doesn't match um, with the school uh, and, and the language of instruction. Now, at the same time, um, like any teaching that teachers are doing, we welcome and respect and bring in, um, you know, the cultural diversity that's represented in the classroom. And for linguistically um, diverse classrooms, we can really make bridges. The more we know about the student's first language and what mm -hmm. sounds it shares with the language of instruction, um, so we can both respect and welcome that first language in the classroom to the extent that we are able, and as well to make bridges into uh, the language of instruction. So always with respect and with um, 
recognizing the strengths. Many students have strengths in their first language that aren't yet seen in the language of instruction. And we want to make sure that uh, these are um, these competencies in the language of instruction are, are also built. So I think high expectations for all students and teaching in a manner that is going to reach most all students uh, is really important. And Patricia, the goal, I, uh, just to echo what Jamie is saying, is to reach all students from the inquiry. Um, which students are most at risk of being failed by the system that we have right now? From the, the report, we say that um, students, I'd call them the, the um, vulnerable students. And I use that vulnerability um, class and I'm going to go down and uh, um, I define it in by number one. We learn that students with disabilities have that problem, but they also find that the problem also is present with students who come from multilingual, as uh, Jamie was just saying, multilingual homes, students who have um, who come from socioeconomic disadvantaged homes, they are in where you have, for example, um, indigenous homes, blacks, and other racialized uh, communities. We that is um, we see that significant that significant problem, mm -hmm. and. Um, as I said, black students. And to give you some, some statistics about that, approximately 25% of students are at risk for reading disabilities. Dyslexia is the most prevalent disability in schools, but students with other disabilities as well may also struggle to learn to read when, it, when you have an ineffective approach um, in the classroom. And so because of this marginalization and structural inequity, um, Blacks and other racialized students, First Nations, Métis, multilinguals I mentioned before, and from low income background, they are at that very high risk to have reading difficulties. And I'm guessing too, Patricia, some parents might not be aware that their child has uh, a learning disability, correct? It is true for, for many reasons. And that is because of the inconsistency of the methodologies that are used in, in the school. Some of them are so ad hoc. And when the, the parents go and um, to the teacher and, and complain that, oh, my grade three uh, son or daughter uh, is not reading, they say, oh, don't worry, they'd catch up. But when you don't have that consistent um, you know, approach to teaching and there is no consistent um, measure Parents would always be trusting of the teacher because in some cultures they are taught to be trusting of the teacher and become very disappointed when they do not see the results that they expect from their, um, from their children. Uh, and Katie, why do you think mm -hmm. the curriculum we have right now is failing students with learning disabilities in particular? When you think about um, that 3Q system of whole language that Jamie talked about, um, you know, relying on context and sentence structure and syntax and visual perceptual skills. Um, some of these students, especially the ones that, um, you know, like minorities or students that um, are English language learners or from low socioeconomic situations, they don't have that same context or vocabulary or experiences that we are, you know, assuming, wrongfully assuming that they do have. Um, and so I just think that it does a disservice for, to our kids that may potentially have learning disabilities because we, we don't know how to specifically target them. And without that you know, psychoeducational assessment mm -hmm. that gives us the recommendations and dives into a student's strengths and needs, you know, uh, sorry, Patricia, you use, you use the word ad hoc. Yeah, we're just kind of trying our best and hoping it works. And in the meantime, the children struggles, and then it kind of just they do. becomes this uh, do do. domino effect. Um, Jamie, mm -hmm. why did Ontario move away from the phonics approach uh, if it's the best strategy across the board? I, I'm not sure I can speak to that exactly because I wasn't, you know, part of of that decision making. Or um, I, I, yes. I, I think there really was this belief in the way that reading develops differently. Um, 
And we've learned a lot more about phonics. It's it's not just bringing back phonics. Um, it's teaching in different ways. Um, really, it's it's teaching the complex layers of the language because we do have the sound symbol associations. We also have morphology. Uh, we know now that children who struggle uh, struggle to, can often struggle to hear the individual sounds within words. So we now know to target that. And I would say that when we teach in this manner, what we're trying to do is prevent reading failure. So mm -hmm. if we teach this way in grade kindergarten and grade one and two, we're trying to prevent most children from developing <laughs> reading difficulties, which which become, you know, diagnosed as reading disabilities and dyslexia. So there will be, um, you know, a segment, and it will be small when we can teach in this way who will have dyslexia and we'll have to mm -hmm. make sure that we continue to meet their needs. But it really is a preventive approach. And so um, really it was uh, an idea of what reading was that moved us to whole language and then not following the data when it was shown that those theories don't match with one, how skilled readers read, and two, how children learn best to read. So I think the report really is focusing on, you know, what do we know from research, from meta-analyses? And again, it focuses on the word reading foundational skills. However, many times in the report, it also states that there are other components of literacy that we need to also focus on, we need to think about from the research, what works best for those as well, whether it be oral language and vocabulary, syntax, knowledge, um, what works best. And let's put those together to create a whole literacy mm -hmm. curriculum as well as writing instruction. Um, and so I think the report really focuses on that and it's time to move away from whatever took us to whole language in the first place. Well, in response to the Right to Read inquiry, um, uh, the Ministry of Education uh, had a news release published on February 28, 2022, and it outlined Ontario's plan to strengthen reading supports for students. I'd like to read a passage from the release. Uh, the ministry had this to say, as an immediate first step and in response to the recommendations of the OHRC's report, Ontario is making a $25 million investment in evidence-based reading intervention programs and professional assessment to support learning recovery and enable school boards to immediately begin meeting the needs of struggling readers. Uh, funding is being made available for this school year and will carry through into the 2022-2023 school year. Uh, Patricia, is the ministry doing enough to address the report's recommendations? I give context. During the inquiry, we began to call on government and education partners to make substantive changes. And as you just mentioned, within an hour of the release of the report, the Ministry of Education announced that it will be um, revising its language curriculum in English and French to align with scientific evidence-based approaches that emphasize direct and systemic introduction. And that was going to take place as early as, 20, as September 2023. And collaborating with partners, including faculties on, you know, on teacher training, and that is really critical. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not to say that the teachers are not dedicated, but if they're not trained to teach, that can be a problem. So that was a great response. And so there was this um, pledge to do further investment for evidence-based reading intervention programs and professional assessment. And you can, you know, for, for listeners, you can go on the Ontario Human Rights website for a broader um, based question um, response to the Right to Read report. And the, the Ministry of Education response to, to our recommendations also include aligning the elementary and English language curricula with science um, and evidence-based approach mm -hmm. that emphasize direct and systemic um, instructions. And, and, and I just want to say though, that um, to, to the sufficiency of their response, we are unable to give comment on that, but what we can tell you that there was a collaborative approach during the inquiry, and we will continue to 
engage in that collaboration. And we will continue to call on the ministry to upgrade their, their kindergarten programs. And we will continue to work uh, with the ministry and other partners and uh, stakeholders collaboratively um, with, uh, to ensure that every child realize their right to read. I, I believe this inquiry is a clarion call to our education system and it goes beyond Ontario and it has been praised uh, by its counterparts all over the world, including the United States. And it has been hailed as a groundbreaking work in, in education. And mm -hmm. quite frankly, I see that as a, a foundation that we can use to um, tackle the vestiges of the industrial, um, industrial colonial era in which we continue to um, educate our children. Mm -hmm. And so specifically, um, this has not only been important for raising awareness about these issues, but we have also achieved the result and we can build lasting equity through the prism of literacy in the process, literally save lives for a whole generation of students. Um, and Katie, just to uh, build on what uh, Patricia was just saying there, we only have mm -hmm. about uh, two minutes left, but mm -hmm. I imagine, you know, once we have these kind of reports and then um, there's a, probably a, a period of time before things are implemented or taken to the next step. Do you worry that during this time, more students will be, uh, maybe might fall through the gaps? It's hard to it's hard to generalize that. I think that there are some very passionate educators out there that are deeply involved in uh, the outcome of this right to read and they're gonna put their hearts and souls into, you know, making sure that doesn't happen, but we can't, you can't guarantee that for everybody. You know, I, I really hope that uh, these great tools and professional development um, are given to teachers. And I really hope that um, Teachers College starts really focusing on those science-based approaches. And I also hope, again, this is just my own opinion, that there we make note of classroom structure and classroom environment. And when we have large classes that are difficult to manage, any good strategy is going to be difficult to provide. So class size matters. Um, a big thank you to all. Oh, sorry, did you want to add something else? <laughs> no, that's it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much to all of you for taking some time with us because I think this is such um, uh, such an informative uh, conversation because I think for a lot of parents, there's those struggles where your child is not learning the way you're told that they should be learning. Um, and so this has opened up that conversation. Thank you so much for your time. We really mm -hmm. do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much you. for bringing this to mm -hmm. the attention of the people of Ontario. They need to hear it. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.